right now, please. Good afternoon. It's good to see all of you again. I hope you're doing okay. Uh, the news on TV and on the internet is a little bit uh, depressing today. I don't really want to go into that because I think class should be a sanctuary where we don't have to think about horrible things if we don't want to. But I hope you're doing okay. I hope all your loved ones are doing okay today. Um, <clears throat> today, uh, we're going to talk about some collections in the C++ uh, uh, Stanford Collection Library, particularly focus on one called Vector. I have a couple of quick announcements first. Uh, I want to remind you that Homework 1 is out and it's due to this Friday afternoon. Um, if you haven't looked at it yet, please go look at it. Please get started. I think for those of you who are still shopping and trying to decide if you want to be here or 106B, I think doing Homework 1 is a good way to get a gauge of that. Remember that homework one for us has three parts. Our three parts are called Mad Libs, Game of Life, and Photoshop. And homework for 106B is just Photoshop. So I guess you could start with that one, and then if you say, oh shit, yep. <laughs> you can switch to B. Um, however, I do think Photoshop is the hardest of the three for what it's worth. So if you like start there, because that's the reusable one, you are testing yourself on the hardest part of the homework assignment, just so you know. Um, some people have asked about pairs working in teams. I think our course info sheet says that you cannot work in pairs. On this assignment, you cannot, but our head TA, Amy, has a heart, and she convinced me that I should let you on later assignments, and I will talk about that after. But this one is uh, an individual assignment because I want everybody to have set up Cute Creator on their machine. I want everybody to have solved a tricky problem by themselves before we move forward. Um, anyway, that's out. It's due Friday at 6. Our lair starts this week. That's our help lab. If you uh, want to go get help on the homework, you're welcome to do so. If you click this link that says lair hours, it'll tell you there's people there tonight starting at 6 o'clock. And they're, they're, that's our section leaders. They will be happy to help you if you need any, anything from Cute Creator doesn't work, compiler errors, I don't understand this part of the spec, or whatever. Anything you want. They can't tell you exactly how to solve the assignment, but they'll help you with debugging and they'll answer questions and they know what's going on with all of these assignments. So I encourage you to use that resource. That's our like primary number one help resource. If you can't make it in one of these evenings, you can also go to our Piazza forum and post messages there. Uh, you have a question? Yeah. Is the website going under maintenance? Is the time time track for the last couple of days it's been down? This layer website about these hours is under maintenance? Okay, I don't get a good internet signal in here, so I'll check on that later. But um, I'll tell you that uh, the lair is on the first floor of Tresseter Union, which is mentioned in our info sheet. It is open tonight starting at 6. So if you want to go there, regardless of this dumb web page, <laughs> there will be somebody there to help you, okay? Um, I will check on the website issue later. Sorry about that. That's an external link that I don't maintain, so I'll look into that. Um, in terms of, I mentioned the phrase section leaders. They're, those are the people who are going to be staffing the lab. Those are undergrads like you who took this course recently and then they apply to work for us to help you with assignments. Um, and you're going to meet your section leader this week. Most of you, hopefully all of you, remembered to fill out this form over the weekend to sign up for availability for sections. You're going to get a reply email from our staff, I believe tomorrow afternoon, with information about what section you've been assigned to. If you forgot to fill out the form, it's okay, uh, we have a late sign up, but you'll be given a chance to uh, submit that information this week after the section leaders are done allocating everyone else to the sections. They got a lot of work to do to put all the names in all the boxes to get that figured out. So they'll email tomorrow about that, I believe, tomorrow afternoon. Okay, uh, those are my announcements. I want to jump into some material. So last time, we talked about several topics last week. We were kind of getting to know the C++ language, and we started talking about collections. What was the collection we did last time? Grid. Grid, thank you. And so what's a grid? Somebody just kind of briefly, what is a grid? What's it used for? It's, yes, sir? It's a, stand, a Stanford local library that is essentially an array, but with more helpful functions, like checking if you go out of bounds and stuff. Yeah, it's, uh, it's essentially an array, a two-dimensional array, that's important, but with some extra functions for things like bounds checking and, and filling the array with data, this kind of stuff, right. So that's basically what a grid does. There's a couple things I want to mention about grids that I think are important. I mentioned some of these things before, but I want to just emphasize them if you go use them for homework, which you do on homework one. Um, this is the grid, the grid.h where you can specify the elements and the size of the thing, and then you get these elements stored in there. You specify what data type in the, the angle brackets. Um, the things I want to mention here are, I want to talk about passing a grid as a parameter. I mentioned this really brief, briefly, but we were packing up and leaving. I just want to re-emphasize. <clears throat> we talked about this, right? What does this mean? Reference. Reference, F by reference, right? 
you should pretty much always pass grids by reference if you're ever passing a grid as a parameter from one function to another. The reason you should do that is because a grid is a big, bulky thing that takes a lot of memory, and if you don't pass it by reference, what does C++ do? It makes a full copy of the whole grid, which doesn't break your program, it doesn't cause the program's behavior to be wrong, but it's just very inefficient. One of the things I want to start to talk about today is program efficiency, and bless you, and you just don't want to copy a grid every single time you pass it around as a parameter. Now, of course, if you pass something by reference, that means that your grid is shared with that other function, right? So that other function could modify your grid. And that's a danger, that's a potential danger for the person who calls this function. I'll give you my grid, but could you please not mess with it? If you want to pass something by reference, but you want to promise that you will not modify its contents, you can pass what's called a const reference, where you write the word const in front of the type, and then it's down here where you can't see if you're in the back. But if you write the word const, that's similar to the word final in Java, if you know Java. It makes it so that this grid cannot be changed. So if you try to call set or clear, it will not compile. So that's actually a good const reference is a good way to share and have the efficiency without having the risk of modification by the, by the function in the back. Yeah? What if you intentionally want to make a copy? Is this a good way of doing it or are there other ways that matter? If you intentionally want to make a copy, it's okay to pass by value. The cases where you want to do that are rare, and actually I think a better style as a personal choice is that I would pass it by reference anyway, maybe by const reference, and then inside the function I would say grid copy equals g. And when you do equal sign and assign one object to another in C++, unlike in Java, it will make a copy of that object. In Java, if you set one object equal to another, they sort of refer to the same object and it doesn't make a copy, but it will make a copy in C++, which I think is a better a better general style, even though they both end up basically doing the same thing. So, Okay, so remember that when you pass collections, pass them by reference. Another data type that you ought to pass by reference is if you are passing a file stream, like an if stream as a parameter, you want to pass that by reference because you don't want to make multiple copies of the file reader as you go through your code. So anyway, uh, another question, yeah? Uh, do you put const in the prototype as well? The, this, the word const you have to put it, if you do the, the prototypes with the semicolon, you have to put const up there, and you have to put const down below when you write the body of the function. In fact, something that maybe I should add to this slide is if, you, if they mismatch, if the semicolon prototype says const and then the function body doesn't say const or vice versa, you'll get this confusing error that says symbol not found for architecture x8664, <laughs> and that's all it tells you, and it won't even usually give you a line number. And so that's an example of Qt Creator being really, really helpful. In fact, can I, can I demonstrate this? Uh, <laughs> Basically, between my hatred for the C++ language and my hatred for Qt Creator, I've just got a lot of aggression when I teach this course. So <laughs> if, if I do void foo const int x, you can pass an int as const, although it's less useful. But then here if I say, uh, let's see, foo 42. But now down here if I write void foo and I say int x, I believe I'll get the error now. Uh, <laughs> no, I didn't get there. <laughs> Great. Uh, I, yeah, maybe it's if this one has no const and this one does. I don't know. This language is so stupid, you guys. Seriously. It doesn't even fail right, you know? Um, wait, okay. <laughs> wait, oh, I should run it? Oh, God, I'm scared. What if this one's int reference and the other one is just int? How about that? Uh, okay, I get a different error. I forget, I'll, I'll find it later, but basically, if you have a mismatch between const somewhere and not const elsewhere, you often get error messages that are not very helpful, is my point, so whatever. Anyway, be aware of the reference and const issue when you pass parameters. Uh, if you wanna practice grids, I'm not gonna do this problem in class just for time, I wanna get on a new material, but there are these exercises like this where it says write a function that takes a grid and tries to compute this or that. You can also try to solve these exercises in our Code Step-by-Step -step website uh, if you wanna try to practice with grids before you start on the homework. Yeah, in the back. Uh, sorry, I didn't get the, you use a constant Oh, you repeat it. Oh, so if you say const in one place, but you don't say const in the other place, like the pr pr prototype. Are you defining like two different functions? Or is this, or, 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 Sorry, can you say that again? Um, are you like defining two different functions that take the same parameter? Oh, well, I, I, think, I think the most common way that this happens for a student is you write a function called foo and you take a vector or a grid or some kind of collection as a parameter, and then later you're about to turn it in and you think, oh, 
Marty said I should pass that by reference so you add an ampersand, but you forget to add it in one of the two places. You add it up in the semicolon prototype, but you forget to add it down below or vice versa. Or the same thing with const. You start out, you don't make anything const. Later you go back and you go, oh, Marty said we should make some stuff const. So you, you put const on some of the parameters, but you forget to one of the two places. That's often where you'll introduce this kind of error. And then the compiler message is sometimes not very easy to understand. So that's something to be aware of. If, the, if these messages, by the way, um, I see your hand one second. If, if you see these compiler errors and they're pretty hard for you to figure out, particularly if you don't even get a line number over here, which sometimes happens, what you can do is there's this tab that says compiler output. See that it's got a little number four next to it? If you click that, it's like the raw output from the compiler. For some reason, Qt Creator takes this and tries to pretty it up, but it doesn't always do it right. And so like here, this will tell me like, oh, it's on this line error or whatever. Sometimes over here in this issues tab, the main one, it's hard to read the error, but sometimes over here in this compile output tab, you can read it. So be, be mindful of, of that issue. Now there was another hand up, yeah. Yep. So if you want to make a new reference to an object, how do you do that? Oh, the equals operator makes a reference, it makes a copy, so how do you make a reference? You use the same ampersand reference syntax, but you declare a variable using that syntax. Okay. Um, I'll come to that later in the course, but that would be what you do. Uh, yeah, in the black. So once you use const, you don't have to include the ampersand? Oh, the question is about whether const and ampersand need to be used together, or what happens when you do or don't use them together. Um, I think that... You said if I use const, does that mean I no longer need to use the ampersand? I would say that's not true. I don't agree with that statement. But um, they do separate things. The ampersand means don't make a copy, share, right? And the const means don't let this function modify this thing. So it could be a copy or not, but you could still lock it down for modification. So there's kind of separate points. The const basically makes certain methods not compile anymore. If you try to call dot clear dot fill dot set, those methods won't compile if you said const. Those methods will compile whether you say ampersand or not, but whether they affect main is changed. Uh, yeah? Um, why would you ever use const without an ampersand? Oh, const without ampersand? I don't know. For, for an object like a grid, you probably wouldn't. Um, for like Sometimes you pass a const int or a const string because you, you just want the f code of the function not to change it or something. Okay. But it's, it's more rare, I agree. One more, and then I want to move on. Yeah? If you're using prototype function definitions, is it preferable to put your documentation for the function in the prototype or the implementation or the other? Yeah, that's a good question. Do you put your comment here at the prototype or do you put your comment down here? Uh, I will let you choose whatever you prefer. I think what's more common is to put them here and put no comment at all on the body because I think the idea is you should just be able to look at this only and then know what you need to know. You shouldn't have to read all the implementation code of how it works in order to use this function. So that's, I think, the idea there. It's meant for a, a client of this code. Okay, so having said all that, uh, I'm moving on from Grid, actually, to talk about another collection called Vector. So you guys have had some prior programming knowledge. You guys have probably heard of a collection in Java. It's called an array list. In Python, it's called a list. In JavaScript, it's called an array. So um, most languages have the notion of some structure that stores elements in order with 0, 1, 2, 3 indexes on them. That's what we call a vector in C++. So that's what I'm going to talk about today. In some ways, a vector is simpler of a thing than a grid. So you might seem to think it's weird that we cover grid first. And I'll confess, we cover grid first because I need it for the homework assignment. <laughs> so probably if there were no such thing as homework, I would have talked about vector on Friday and grid today. But oh well, whatever. Um, so a vector, some languages call it a list. Like I said, it's a collection of elements that have indexes that start with zero. Some languages have a separate concept like from list that's called array, which is sort of a fixed size thing, whereas a list might be a dynamically resizing type of a thing. Uh, I'm going to focus on the one that resizes dynamically. If you use Java, an array, once you make a size of an array, it's <laughs> stuck on that size forever. But if you make an array list, it grows and shrinks. So um, let's see. If you want to use vectors in C++, you import this library, include vector.h. It's got the quotation marks. That means it's a Stanford local project library that we wrote here on this university. Um, you can initialize a vector by seeing what type of elements it's going to store. And then if you know what the values are at the start, you can put them in curly braces. So that's a vector of five elements right there. Or you can make an empty vector, and then you can add elements to it by saying dot add. So it grows from being an empty list to a one element list to a two element list to a three element list. It grows and shrinks as needed, right? 
Uh, down at the bottom of the slide, I have an example of an array. Because students always ask me, like, why are we learning about vectors and lists and we didn't learn about arrays yet? What doesn't C++ have arrays? Uh, it does have arrays, but they suck. So I don't want to use them yet. Maybe later we'll use them. This language has a bunch of dumb stuff in it that I'd rather not talk about if I can get away with it. In fact, you know, there were definitely people after class on Friday who were asking me a bunch of interesting questions about the language and about syntax and stuff like that. And I'm happy to always talk about that stuff. But I do think the sort of zen of this course is that C++ isn't really the point. It's a language that is used for some situations and not others. You might never code C++ again after this. So I think getting lost in the details of C++ is not really the point of the class. Really, I want to talk about managing data and writing algorithms and these other bigger picture kinds of things. Even though the, it, the details can be interesting too, right? Uh, yes? So uh, if you just want a list, it would have a fixed size, then what's wrong with using an actual array? Oh, if all you want is a fixed size collection, why not just use an array? Because the benefit of this vector thing is that it grows and shrinks. What if I don't want to grow and shrink? Uh, I would say, in general, right, the benefits are a little bit less if it's going to be fixed size. But the regular array is missing a lot of things. Like, you can't ask it to search for an element, or you can't uh, sort it easily. You can't, um, if, if you try to go out of bounds on an array, C++ will give you garbage data, whereas this thing will give you an error message to help you debug. So there are a lot of other benefits that I think are better about this. In fact, one of my least favorite things about C++ arrays, they don't even know their size. So you can't even ask it how many elements back it has. This thing, of course, does let you ask that. So I would say just in general, because arrays aren't very good, they don't do hardly anything at all. Uh, yes, question? Right, uh, C++ comes with that STL collection library. It has a vector class in it as well, which you import with the angle brackets instead of the quotes. What's different about that one versus this one? I mean, I would say I don't want to go into too much detail about that right now because I don't want to teach those collections until the end of the course. Like, I want to teach you all of our collections, and you get used to them, you try them out, you do homeworks with them, and then later in the course, once your collection ninjas, I'll say, hey, here's this other one that's really simple, and it'll be easy for you to convert over. Um, I mean, to give you a really brief answer to your question, they have a lot of the same operations, but they use slightly different names or slightly different syntax for them. So if you learn this one, it'll be a pretty quick mapping to the other one. If you're curious, you can Google for STL vector tutorial or something. And the order of the is all of N? Uh, you're talking about big O of N, and I want to talk about that later in the lecture. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Is grid a vector of vectors or something else? <laughs> is a grid a vector of vectors? Um, it is implemented using, I believe, a two-dimensional array internally. If you want to know, you can actually open grid.h in a project and look at it. Uh, one more, then I would move on. Yeah. Uh, don't we need the z-proof inside in the vector declaration, or is that how it is? Oh, vector nums equals? No, this works. This is a legal syntax. Yeah, you don't need an equal sign. It will compile with an equal sign, but you don't need one. Yeah. Kind of weird. That's just like a syntax C++ has. Okay, so vectors. Yeah, why don't we use arrays? I guess I, I already kind of said what was on this slide. Arrays suck. They don't do anything. They don't know their size. They don't know their bounds. They're missing all the operations you want. I already talked about this, so I'm not going to go into it. Um, here are some of the methods that vectors have. <clears throat> the most common things I think that you'll do with a vector is add elements, get the elements out, and remove elements, and maybe ask for the size or print a vector. Those are the most common things that you'll do, but there's lots of other methods as well. Vectors allow you to use this bracket syntax to access the elements, or you can say .get, which looks more like Java. Um, both of those are equal. You can use both of those syntaxes. So that's pretty cool. When you print out a vector on the console, it shows curly braces with the elements with commas between. So it's pretty easy to print one for debugging. Uh, yeah, question. Does C++ imply the two string if you're doing a CL, can you just do CL vector? <coughs> Oh, um, yeah, in Java, when you print something, it implicitly calls the method toString on that thing to figure out how to print it. C++ actually doesn't have that concept built in as a language. So this class technically offers a toString method, and it is printable. But those are technically completely different pieces of code that happen to do the same thing, because the language does not grant special citizenship to this toString method. What actually is done is you write an operator named less than less than that describes how to print a vector which I don't really want to go into. But yeah, anyway, the toString returns you the string, whereas the output operator prints the thing on the console. In the back, yeah? Is uh, OSTR just an alias for C out? Or is that I just meant output stream. It could be C out, it could be a file, it could be an O string stream. Yeah, sorry, these slides are sometimes a little bit uh, condensed. One more, yeah. So uh, when you're declaring the vector, like, uh, 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 so uh, uh, in the 
includes a less than a greater, in the less than a greater, greater than sign, do you put the type? Do you have to always put the type, let's say if you're having, like, making a new vector, and you set it equal to nums, then can you just say vector, like, without the int in it? You always have to say bracket int every single time. C++ never infers the type of uh, data. Yeah, you have to always write the type in those brackets, just part of the syntax. Um, okay, so those are the methods. I'm not going to spend that much time on them because I bet you've used a structure that's about the same as this in whatever language you learned before you got here. So there you go. Most of these semantics are not shocking to you, I think. How to iterate over a vector. How do you loop over the elements and look at them? Well, pretty standard loop from zero to size, print element bracket i. That's like probably your most common way to loop over a vector. I'm sure you've written a loop like this before. Um, if you want to go backwards, you can loop from size minus one down to zero. You've probably done something like that before. There is a for each loop where you say for each string, whatever, located in this vector called names. So remember, this is a vector string with names up here. So for each string that's in there, I will print that. So if you haven't seen that syntax before, basically it's pretty much the same as this one up here, except it sort of sets this variable name to be names zero, and then names one, and then names two. It sort of pulls out each element, stores it in this local variable, and then lets you access it, and then loops around and does the same thing for the next element. Internally, this is using a structure called an iterator that is inside of the vector to help implement this behavior. Um, there's a variation of the for each loop. If you write an ampersand, it does a for each loop by reference. <laughs> the difference between these two, you mostly just use this first one, but if you use the second form of the ampersand, then if you actually change this value of this local variable, it actually reaches into the vector and changes the elements of the vector. So like you can actually loop over it and modify it using this syntax, which is kind of trippy. Uh, in the back of the blue, yeah. Um, so can a vector only have one type of variable? A vector can only store one type of value. Yeah, if you want to store multiple types, there are some hacks to do that. I um, mean, in, in other languages, there's some super type called like object. In C++, you have to use something called pointers to help get this kind of functionality, but for the most part, we're just going to work with one type uh, inside of a given vector. Yeah, in the front show. Uh, if you have a vector where each element is like a grid or something else, if you do a for loop and not by reference, will that end up copying each? <laughs> That's a good question. Uh, I do have a slide in a minute about c collections of collections. If your vector stores other vectors and you for each over it, it does make a copy of each inner vector as it loops through. So you would especially want to maybe loop over those by reference. Yeah, that's subtle, but that's a thing that will come up. Basically, there's a rule of C++ whenever you have an object and you make a new variable to talk to that object that isn't a reference variable, it will make a copy of the object to put into that variable. So that's something you have to watch out for. Uh, in the back in the teal, yeah. Is the for each loop guaranteed to go through them sequentially by index? It loops over them by index, yeah, from zero to the end. You can't change that order, that's just the order that it gives. If you care about the order, being different than this, or if you care about knowing what the indexes are as you're looping, you shouldn't use this, you should use the regular in face. Yeah, follow up, go ahead. Can you, can you modify the vector within the for each loop, or? If you use this reference form here, you can modify the uh, elements as you look at them. Can you like insert and remove elements from the vector? Uh, oh, oh, in here, if you call delete or insert, yeah. um, that will confuse the vector because you're changing its capacity and size and stuff as you're iterating over it. It will likely lead to a, an exception crash. Um, more corruption. Uh, yes? For each loop loops in order from zero to the end, just like a regular for loop. Okay, so uh, one thing to watch out for, you know, the neat thing about vectors <coughs> is that you can add elements to them at any spot and it will make room for the new element. So for example, if you say insert at index two, the value 42, and this is the old state of the vector, it'll go just before index two and it'll sort of slide everybody over and make room, and then it'll put the new element there. That's pretty neat. Regular array in Java or something doesn't know how to do that. Um, if you tell it that you want to remove an element, it will delete that value, and then it will slide every element over to the left by one to cover up the, the spot to, to use up all the room. So that's pretty neat. Occasionally, that can lead to bugs where you're looping and you're inserting or something like that the, one of the questions was asking about. But these are nice features to have for insertion in the middle and at the end. Um, one thing I'll talk about in a few minutes is that the fact that the vector does this implies that it is slower to insert and remove things closer to the front of the vector. Because if you insert something here, you have to slide everybody over. Whereas if I delete something over here, I don't have to slide anybody over. 
if I delete something around here, it's kind of I have to slide some of them over, but not all of them. That takes time, uh, more time, the more elements you have to slide. The computer needs more processing time to do that. We'll talk about that in more detail in a minute. But I think the real world analogy is obvious, right? Like if, if I pick somebody in the front row and I say, hey, move over, I got a new student, I need to seat here. Everybody has to get up and move over. It takes more trouble to, to do that, right? So anyway, that's a cool feature of a vector. Um, I've got some, some code exercises here. Uh, I think I'm gonna do one of these. I'm gonna write one with you called remove all, where you pass a vector of strings as a parameter and you pass an element value, what you wanna get rid of. And I'll wipe out all occurrences of that value out of the vector. Okay, so if I have a vector that says A, B, C, B, D, E, A, B, and you say remove all the Bs, you'll be left with just A, C, A. Okay, so if I go to my project, if you want to play along, this project is on the class web page under the lecture calendar for today. Let me delete these foo things from earlier. So I already come in with a method main, function main, uh, where I made a vector, and I print the vector, and then I remove all the Bs, and then I print the vector again. See that? Just want to see if you did it or not. <laughs> and so up here, I have the heading of the function. Give me a vector and remove all of this string. So if I just compile it and run it, I think what I'll see is that it just doesn't remove anything yet. Right, because we didn't, we didn't do this yet, right? Yeah, so actually, let me just change this to say v2 before remove colon, and this to say v2 after remove. There, okay. So tell me how you want me to do this. Um, I've got the function header there. Does that look okay? Is that the header that you want me to have for this function? No. 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 Could this be my first mistake as an instructor in my career of teaching? What, what could it be? Uh, what do you not like about my header? Uh, yes, sir. I should pass it by reference. Okay, yeah, that makes sense because I'm calling this function and I'm expecting the vector to be different afterwards in main. For changes in the function to be seen in main, it needs to be passed by reference. Okay, should it be a const reference? No, no. no because the whole point of the function is to change this stupid thing, right? So yes, I don't want to leave it constant. I want to change it. Okay, help me. How do I do this? Okay, iterate loop over it. What kind of loop? Regular for loop or for each loop, forwards, backwards, which way? In the gray, yeah. What do you say? I would say backwards. Okay, so you're saying you want me to loop backwards over this thing. Um, so you want me to say for each i is less than v, or no, you want to start at the other end, v dot size minus one, and then as long as i is greater than or equal to zero. Uh, and then you want me to do what? You can just, uh, if every time you encounter uh, an element that matches s, you can just remove it. Right, so just say if v element i is s, the string I'm looking for, then remove that element. So say v dot remove i. Yeah, uh, okay, let me compile and run that. That's a pretty short piece of code. <clears throat> hey, look at that. Um, I think all the b's are gone, that's great. Um, so, okay, I just wanna point out, I mean, that's a correct solution. I like this solution a lot. I wanna point out a couple variations. One thing I wanna mention, you were astute to say, let's go backwards over this. Let's go from the, the end to the start. Um, what if I had changed it and said, uh, let's go from uh, zero to the end, right? So let's do I, int i equals zero. i is less than v dot size, i plus plus. Well, then what does it do? Well, let's find out. Hey, how come one of them is left in there? Let's just trace the code. I bet a lot of you can see this. So int i starts out right there where that little caret is, right? So I int i equals zero. So if v i equals uh, b, no it doesn't. So I do i plus plus. Okay, now I'm here. Aha, v i does equal s, so I remove that value, right? So yeah. And then my loop wraps back around. So I do i plus plus. So i goes to there, right? So now I say, is that equal to the thing that I want to remove? Yes, it is, so remove that one. Okay, remove it, right? Now my loop wraps back around, so I do I plus plus. Do you see that? So I actually 
when there's two Bs in a row, the forward loop misses the second one because it deletes, which slides everyone over, and I increase my index, which slides me over, so technically I kind of have a movement by two total for that moment, and therefore somebody could get missed. So looping backwards works better because uh, the elements to the right of you that are shifting are ones that you have already looked at at any given moment. Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. So say while v i equals s for move i. Um, that might work, except I think there might be a bug case there where like what if it ends with like, you know, three b's. Doesn't that, I'm going to compile and I'm going to run and it cr crashes because I think what happens is like it's chomping those b's, but eventually there's no element left there. And it says, hey, is the next element a, a B? And there's like, oh, I fell off the edge of the vector. There's no element here. You could patch that by saying, you know, while I is still less than V dot size, and, but I think actually at that point it's not as clean. I think I like the other way. So I would just go back to if, and I go back to this, and then I think I'm good. Or we can also add I minus minus. That's another way, true, absolutely. You could leave it this, where was it? Uh, if you could remove and you could say I minus, oops, I minus minus to go back and then your plus, plus will put you back where you were. That works too. I, I kind of don't like it because it's a little bit kludgy. It's like, why is there an I minus minus here? I think the best solution overall is this one, but those other ways also can be made to work too. Yes, sir. Hey, uh, so is the V dot sign constantly the loop? The loop has, this is just like most languages. This part right here is evaluated once and only once at the start of the loop. Yeah. This part here is evaluated every pass afterward, or before, I guess. Um, so if this part that I've highlighted contained v dot size, it would recall v dot size over and over if v dot size was changing. So it would see those changes. And this part here is incremented after each pass. So yeah, the, the second and third of the three chunks are evaluated on each repetition, but the first chunk is only at the start of the loop, right? Yeah. Oh, the for each loop. Um, the thing about the for each loop is it's pretty good for for like changing an element, like here where you have an existing string and you want to change it. It's kind of hard to like delete a string so it's just gone. You could imagine setting it to be an empty string or something, but now you have a vector with elements in it that are empty strings rather than the absence of an element. So it's not quite the same thing. So yeah. Anyway, okay, that's just a short coding example. If you want to play with little coding vector examples, there's lots of them in step-by-step -step and other places in the book and all kinds of exercises. Mostly, I think vector is pretty familiar to something you've seen before, I would guess, so I'm not going to spend a ton of time on, on what it is and how it works. Um, I do want to briefly talk about collections of collections. Somebody asked about that a few minutes ago. So you can have a vector, I don't know if this code is hard to read, but you can make a vector, a couple of vectors of ints. And then you can make a vector of vectors of ints, and you can add the vectors of ints to the vector of vectors of ints. <laughs> and then you can print the vector of vectors of ints, and it looks like that. And you can actually access using nested brackets v dash one dash one. That means go to row, go to element of index one, which is this row. And then within that row, go to the element of it that's at index one, which is so it should print three. You can in initialize the whole thing in one line or in one statement if you want using that syntax. Uh, so that looks a lot like a grid, right? It's sort of a two-dimensional thing. How is this a little bit different from a grid, other than just the, the minor uh, use of the word vector instead of instead of uh, grid? Yeah, right. They have different lengths. The rows can be different lengths. Yeah, it could be more of a triangular rather than a grid. It has to be rectangular shape. So you might say, oh, this one's better. I don't know. I, I think if you know you want a rectangle, <laughs> grid is good. But if you have different lengths for each one for some reason, maybe a vector is good. Uh, another question. Yeah. How do you make a vector? A vector with elements of different types. I, I can't teach you that today because we have to know about pointers for that, basically. But you can do it. It's complicated, but you can do it. Yeah. I noticed that when you wrote vector on vector event, you put a space between the two right angle brackets. Is that to prevent it from confusing it with the operator of two right angle brackets? See, now I, you guys, I, I love extracting compliments about myself from innocuous statements that you make that are not meant to compliment me. <laughs> because do you see what he did? He said, why do you have this space here? Do you need that for the syntax? He didn't say, hey, dumbass, you messed up. If you put a space that wasn't, he trusted that I must have meant 
<laughs> There's no way that I just screwed up and put an accidental space there. From both places. But actually, in this case, you're right. I did do this over. But I'm just saying, thank you for assuming that I meant to do. That means you think I have good attention to detail, or that's how I choose to interpret what you said and didn't say. Um, <laughs> You know, we need reasons to feel good about ourselves, right? So that's my deal. Uh, I know when to put spaces in things. Um, I think you should put a space at the beginning. It's wonky. It's lopsided. So you want a space over here? Yeah. Listen, stay in your lane, pal. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, just anyway, uh, why, the, just quickly, the reason I have a space here is that older versions of C++ compiler, if you had the two closing brackets right next to each other, it thought you were reading from a file with the arrow operator, and it confused the compiler. But as of like five years ago, they fixed it. But most people still do it this way in case you ever have somebody compile on the old compiler. C++ is so stupid. Um, but yeah, technically, if you took the spaces out, it would work for all you guys, because you just installed your compiler recently, so you're fine. Um, but yeah. OK, anyway, you can have a collection of collections. I don't think this particular example is super common, but you sometimes have a, uh, a, a grid of, of vectors or a vector of maps or all these different things I'll show you about um, as we go on. Yeah. Is there a way to note in your source file that Oh, uh, to, to denote what kind of compiler that you want? Well, you can, but the ironic thing is that like the compiler that precedes the one you want won't understand if you ask for what you want, because it'll be like, I've never heard of that. Like if you say, I want the 2011 version, it'll be like, there's no such thing as that. <laughs> because it's, it's 2007, right? That's when I was built. So uh, you know what I mean? The compiler that, you, that doesn't understand won't do what you want. I mean, you can, you can write these build files that check for things like that. Uh, it's kind of out of scope of the class. I mean, I'm not going to make you do anything that has to worry about that stuff. But I think when you run into it is like if you have to run on some ancient server farm that you didn't build, and then you discover, you try to go compile your C++ program, and you'll have a couple new warnings or errors you didn't expect. And you Google them, and you discover, oh, they changed that in the language in 2009. Oh, so this server must be from 2008 or 7 or something. But it happens a little bit, but whatever. Um, OK, so I want to talk about less about what the vector is, because I think you can figure that out, or at least already know how to do some of that. I want to talk more about how it's built on the inside, and I want to talk about this efficiency discussion with what we call big O notation. Mostly it comes from chapter 10 of the book. Inside of a vector, there is an array. And when I say array, I mean this fixed size chunk of memory that can store things in the Java sense of the word array, or the C sense of the word array. A vector actually, for the most part, stores three things. It stores an array, and it stores two integers called the size and the capacity. So if you make this vector, it has six elements in it. So as, as a user of a vector, the way you think of this is that it's, a, it's like an array of size six, basically, right? But that it could grow if you needed it to do so. But really, inside of here, it's often bigger than size six. It's like size 10 or something. Could be 10, could be 20, could be 100. It's going to be at least six, but probably more than six. And the reason that they do this instead of making it just be exactly six is because then if you want to add a seventh element, it can just stick it right there at the end of the array. If you had exactly six, but you wanted to add a seventh element, what do you think that you would have to do? You'd have to make a new array that was bigger and copy everything over and then use that new array now for the future. Because arrays are not allowed to grow in size. They don't, they don't have a growth feature. So <clears throat> you use an array that's bigger than what you are telling to the user. So the user thinks this has size 7, but really it's more than that. There's size 6. OK. But so then we have this size 6 and we have this capacity 10. That means like how much space total is there to use. And if the size ever gets as big as the capacity or exceeds it, you copy over to a bigger array. Now, it does raise an interesting question, though. Like secretly, there's another element right here, even though you didn't ask for one. So what if you try to ask for the element of this index? Will it give you this zero out? Because that would be strange, right? Well, what it does in the implementation of the vector, if you ask for the element number seven or whatever, it'll see that it's past the size, and it'll throw an error on you. But technically, there is an element there. It just won't let you see it. OK, so that's what's in there. Now, if you think about inserting, remember how I said everything shifts over? Well, if you want to insert here, OK, I'll move this one to here. I'll move this one to here. I'll move this one to here, and then I'll put your element at index uh, three or whatever, right? And again, because I have this unfilled space, I have capacity to, to do that, right? And if I <coughs> remove, 
I move everybody over the opposite of, of this, um, and I guess I gain back some more capacity. You might say, oh, will it, will it like shrink down the array to fit? Usually, no, because that's not very useful to do. We just leave the extra space at the end. The analogy I like to make here is like uh, when you buy a house. So I told you that my wife and I are expecting, which is awesome, and we're, we, we live in a small house. We're hoping, <laughs> this is the laugh of the day, we're hoping we can buy a house in the Bay Area someday. Ha, 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 ha. <laughs> If y'all support my startup, maybe someday we can. But, um, <laughs> but anyway, uh, when you buy a house, like there's two of us, right? So we could buy a one bedroom house because spoiler alert, we share one bedroom, right? So like we could buy a one bedroom house, <laughs> but that's not gonna be very much space. Well, then we have a baby. Now the baby needs a room, so we'll go buy a two bedroom house. We'll move all of our shit into a two bedroom house. Oh, another baby's coming now. We'll go buy a three bedroom house and we'll move again. What a chore. That would be so much work to move every time you have another baby, right? So, I mean, same thing here. So what you usually do is you go buy a four or five bedroom house. Well, not around here because no one can afford that, but uh, <laughs> I'm glad I managed to work a Bay Area real estate rant into our Vector lecture today. But <laughs> you buy a house with some extra capacity so you can use it when you need it. And then if you ever fill that up, like you just go nuts and you have like eight kids or whatever, you go buy that bigger house when you need it and you move everything in there, but you don't want to move very often, so you want to probably buy one that's a lot bigger than the one you had before. Same kind of idea here, but not as depressing, I think. Um, okay, so one thing I want to point out, we talked about how when you insert and delete, you have to slide elements. So the further to the left you insert from or delete from, the more elements that you have to slide. That means the runtime of these operations is relative to the index on which you ask to perform them. It's interesting to think about. So let's talk about runtime and efficiency for a minute. This word efficiency is kind of a general term. It's a measure of resource usage by a program. So it could, usually when we talk about efficiency, we mean time. How long does it take to run? How efficient is this algorithm? But it could be memory efficiency, like how much RAM does it take to store all the data? It could be um, network efficiency. How many requests do I have to send to the server to solve this problem? Because the network is slow, so I want to optimize on fewest network requests. It could be lots of resources, right? Um, but if I just say efficiency with no context, I'm probably talking about runtime. So uh, how do you talk about program efficiency? It's actually pretty hard to reason about for lots of reasons. Um, computer hardware is complicated and software and compilers are complicated. There's lots of layers up and down from your code that are interfering. Um, but we have to just simplify to have a model so we can talk about these things. So let's decide that it takes one unit of time for a single statement to run. That's not really true, because like it takes longer to, to you know, multiply than it takes to add or whatever, but I don't care, I don't want to think about that. So one statement, like declaring and initializing a variable or calling a function or whatever, a statement takes one time. Um, if you call a function, the time that that takes is the total of the number of statements inside that function. So if I call function foo and there's four statements in foo, then that line of that function call has a cost of four because of the four statements in foo. Now again, that's not correct because it takes a little bit of time to jump over to a function or jump back or whatever, but we're gonna simplify a little bit, okay? And lastly, if you have a loop, a repetition that repeats n times, then the amount of time that that loop takes is n multiplied by the number of statements inside the loop. If you have a loop with three statements in the body and it repeats 10 times, then the loop costs 30. That's about it, pretty simple. I guess I didn't say if else here, but like if there's an if and an else, then like, the cost of the stuff in the if braces or the cost of the stuff in the else braces, depending which way the code ends up going, right? Something like that, right? Simple model. Based on that model, if you look at a piece of code like this, so just to be clear, all of this from statement one down to this closing brace, all of that is like one chunk of code. And you were to say, what do I know about this code? Now, the code refers to some value called n that I didn't specify. Just assume that that's some large number, some variable, okay? Well, if you look at this line of statement one, that takes one unit of time to execute. If you look at this loop, there's a loop of n and a loop of n and then a statement. So this loop here has a runtime of n, but then I repeat that whole loop n times. So the overall runtime of this chunk is n times n, you understand? n squared. This loop down here goes n times and inside there are three statements, so it's three times n. So this whole thing is like n squared plus 3n plus 1, basically, roughly, by our dumb model. So, I mean, this is just math here, but like, if n is 1,000, then it's, you know, a million plus 3 times 1,000 plus 1, so, you know, it's a big number of, of uh, statements, right? 
And the thing I want you to start to take away from this is that certain chunks of code are a lot more costly than others. In fact, this one that says n squared is super costly if n is large, right? But this one here looks maybe like it's just as big as this one. I think some people have intuitions like the size of it on the screen is costly or the number of lines makes it more costly. And sometimes there's a correlation of that, but it really depends what the lines are. Nested repetition is very costly, right? This is the thing that dominates the amount of time that the overall piece of code will take. Yeah? What constitutes the statement? Like is int i equals one different than int i colon and i equals one? Oh, yeah, yeah. If you want to be particular about it, like you could say, well, this is technically, this first part is a statement, and then this check here is a statement. And yeah, you could definitely think of it that way. Um, by my model, that would probably be what you would say. But I'm kind of thinking of it as if there's a loop header and I know the loop will repeat a given number of times, I'm going to simplify that by just multiplying that number of times times what's in the body, even though it would probably be that plus one or two to check you know, some of these, uh, these tests or whatever. Yeah. Do you not define a statement to be uh, a line in which you use an operation, like maybe uh, equating something to something, assigning something to something, maybe addition, subtraction, something like that? Yeah, I mean, you could think of different things as being state. Like, at the end of the day, everything your computer has to compute or look at counts for something, right? And this model is very flawed. <laughs> it's it's uh, an intuitive model that's meant to be really, really simple. And I confess that it's in all kinds of ways incorrect. Um, but, but there you go, here it is. Um, it's still useful for reasoning about. I think my statement still stands that that n squared portion of the code is the, the bad one, the slow one. So when you have a piece of code, imagine you had a bigger, more complicated piece of code and you analyzed it just the same way that we did on the last slide. And you came up with this, you said this piece of code runs that 0.4 n cubed plus 25 n squared plus 8 n plus 17. That's the number of statements I think this will take based on my uh, looking at the code. Well, if you want to reason about algorithms, if you want to have a good intuition for how fast or slow they are, what you really want to look at isn't like exactly what this number adds up to be. You want to think about what's called the growth rate. If, if you have this value n, we, you know, my slide, my last slide had this value n. What was n? It's just some number. But Maybe n is like the size of a vector. We're going to process all the elements of a vector looking for something. Or it's all the people in the class. I'm going to search for a certain student, whatever. It's the, the n is the size of the set of input data that I'm looking at. What you really care about for a given algorithm is what will happen if my size of input data grows. What happens if the class gets twice as large? What will happen to the runtime? A lot of people would say, oh, an algorithm will probably take twice as long to run if the class gets twice as large. But that's not necessarily true. If your algorithm's runtime relative to the input size n is this, then really doubling your n is going to you know, make your uh, runtime here be double times double times double, or, or 8x of the runtime, or whatever. So when we're trying to reason about runtime, here's what you do. If you can come up with an expression like this, you ignore all of your constants, like this 25 or this 8, you just throw them out. They do matter, but you throw them away. Even this 0.4, you throw it away. You say, oh, it's n squared, n cubed plus n squared plus n plus 1 or whatever. And then all you care about is the top term. So really, like of all this, the only part of this that matters for now is that this thing says n cubed. Because if you increase n, you will see a cube of that same increase in the runtime. That's what matters. Yeah, it's true. This assumes something that, that uh, it assumes that our algorithm only depends on one thing. There's a lot of algorithms that depend on two or three different things. How many students are there? How many classes are there? How many universities are there? Whatever. There's, there's a lot of algorithms that depend on more than, you can extend this kind of logic to talk about how each algorithm is growing with relation to each of those things. You can have kind of a multivariate assessment of such a thing. I think at its core, a lot of those assessments simplify to this sort of thing repeated and are greater than or equal to one times, you know? So when we talk about this, we say that this algorithm runs on the order of n to the third, or the short form of saying that is we say that this algorithm is O of n to the third, big O of n to the third. And again, what that means is if I increase n, the change of the runtime of the algorithm will seem to be the cube of that. And so if you look at the vector, you can talk about the efficiency of these different operations of the vector using this sort of terminology. You can say if you want to add a value to a vector, that means put something at the end of the vector. 
that add operation, it doesn't take very much time. You just put something there and increase the size of the vector by one. When something doesn't have a runtime that depends on the size of the input, the list at all, you just say it has a constant runtime which is written as big O of one. It doesn't mean it literally takes one instruction, it just means the amount of time it takes is not related to how big the vector is. Um, if you want to ask for the contents of an element using the square brackets, that takes a constant amount of time because the computer just has to jump to the right place in memory, which isn't relative to the size of the data. If you want to remove or insert things, it has to slide all those elements over. So we say that it takes big O of n runtime. Now one question you might have, just as we're about to go home in just a moment here, is, but I thought it took different amounts. I thought if I insert or delete over here, it was pretty fast, or here it was medium, or here it was really slow. How do I decide what to write here? Well, some people talk about best case, average case, worst case. The best case for insertion and removal is big O of one, constant time at the end. The average case is in the middle. The best case, or the worst case, sorry, is at the far left. If you sort of look at all of them and average it all out, on average, if you're removing from lots of different places, it's gonna be about like you're in the middle here, which is roughly about half of N elements need to be adjusted. Half of N is still on the order of N because we ignore these kind of constants. So we would say on average, these operations take O of n. So this is a language, a shortcut notation for talking about how efficient or inefficient things are. If you want to say this is slow and this is fast, it's more precise to say this is big O of 1 and these are big O of n. Uh, I'm out of time. I'm going to go to my office in Gates 195. If you have any questions about homework or Qt Creator or anything, I'd love to see you over there. I'll be there till 3. Have a great day. See you Wednesday.